Good evening. I want to thank everyone that has joined us. We have um, attending. I want to thank everyone, people attending in person, but also let you know that we have a virtual audience attending on the webinar and also on Facebook Live. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Sulman Aziz Mirza, a child and adolescent psychiatrist with the Nova Keller Center, and Dr. Christopher King, a pulmonologist and medical intensivist. He serves as the medical director of the Transplant and Advanced Lung Disease Critical Care Program at the Nova Medical Campus. Each of the physicians will speak for about 30 minutes, and then the remainder of the time will be open for Q&A. Please, Dr. King, you're welcome to come up. Great. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Chris King. I'm one of the pulmonary critical care doctors here at the hospital and um, was asked to talk with you guys about uh, um, vaping. And, um, uh, and so I'm going to cover more of the medical stuff and uh, some kind of basic statistics, talk about smoking a little bit. And then, um, you know, I, I'm pretty ill-equipped to to talk to you about uh, how to sort of modify your children's behavior. If you've ever seen me at the grocery store with my three kids, uh, you, you could definitely uh, figure that out pretty quickly. And so uh, I'll kick it over to, uh, to Dr. Mirza and then he'll do you know, a little bit more on the uh, you know, modifying behavior and why, you know, why uh, vaping is addictive, et cetera. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. So uh, <clears throat> I'm hoping that uh, my section will, will describe what vaping is, and we'll review some of the products available. I think, uh, you know, if, depending on people in the audience, they might, might be sort of naive in ter terms of what, what's out there. And so we'll cover some of that. And then we'll talk about some of the risks of vaping, and specifically a valley or, or e-cigarette or vaping associated lung disease, which is that outbreak that happened last fall and, and still continuing to some extent. And so we'll, we'll go through uh, what that looks like and, uh, and uh, you know, the uh, outcomes associated with it, et cetera. So uh, it's hard to talk about vaping without talking about smoking. And so um, smoking's bad for you. I don't think that's a newsflash to anyone. Um, now, vaping, uh, on the contrary, when it first came out, was billed as sort of a healthy alternative to smoking by a lot of people. And you still see things like that out there in the press. Um, and, uh, and so we'll cover that. And I think that's a, a fallacy, and it's a... You know, it's something that it's e a lot of the reason that the vaping took off in popularity is because it was viewed as uh, a means of sort of delivery of nicotine, and you still get the the stimulus of smoking, uh, and it's a and you know a potentially safer way of of doing that. But I think that um, it has more immediate health concerns, and we don't really know the long term health effects of, of vaping. You know, if you took if you turn back the clock and you looked at cigarette smoking 10 years from the time that it started, there wouldn't be a wealth of data saying that, that smoking was, was bad for you uh, because it takes time for lung cancers and things like that to happen. But uh, you know, I think over time, we'll have a better uh, you know, sense of the long-term effects of, uh, of vaping on people's health. But, um, but we can certainly say that there are some immediate risks and, uh, and it's, um, it's certainly not good for you. So this is just a slide kind of covering all the many things that, uh, that you guys know about smoking. I think, uh, again, uh, we've been inundated with this since the time we were kids. Um, and, you know, but despite that, people still continue to smoke. And I, I think that uh, you know, a lot of times people focus on the lung disease, but there's a lot of other issues, and in particular heart disease um, and uh, peripheral arterial disease, et cetera, that can come as a consequence of smoking. And so there's a lot of ways that smoking harms you. Um, you know, it's the number, remains the number one preventable cause of death uh, in the United States. Um, it accounts for 7 million deaths a year uh, worldwide and 480,000 deaths a year in the United States. Uh, on average, smokers die 10 years uh, earlier than non-smokers. Um, and if uh, it affects our youth still, um, so if smoking continues at the current rate that it's at, so vaping's kind of outpaced smoking, but it's a risk factor for smoking because a lot of kids that, that vape actually are dual users. And so it can either be an introduction to smoking or they're using them both uh, sort of alternately. And so um, a lot of today's vapors may be tomorrow's smokers, um, particularly if, if uh, vaping becomes uh, you know, less and less uh, commonplace. And, but if you took all the kids that are smoking today, um, 5.6 uh, million kids, uh, less than 18 today, uh, will die from smoking-related illness. So that's one out of every 13 kids that are under 18 in the United States. 
Um, so vaping, this is just a little bit about the history of vaping. It's not a new concept. This, in 1927, someone tried to build uh, an electronic uh, cigarette, and there's been a bunch of products through the years, like I didn't want to belabor it, so but there's stuff from the 1950s and 1960s. Um, but really, the 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 form of vaping that we're familiar with came from uh, in 2003. There was a a, a Chinese smoker and pharmacist named Han Leek, and he de uh, developed something that looks very much like a cigarette, um, and and that's sort of what the modern uh, vaping device uh, uh, stems from. In 2006. Uh, E-cigarettes were, were more broadly introduced in Europe. It didn't take long, 2007. Uh, they spread to the United States. And then there was this sort of period where they were gaining popularity, and the FDA didn't really know how to deal with e-cigarettes. They, they were like, well, they're not quite cigarettes, and so do we regulate them the same way? And they finally came down in 2016, and they announced that they would be regulated under the Family uh, Smoking and Tobacco Control Act. Uh, and so the way that they're sold and things are, they, they have a lot of the same regulations in terms of age restrictions, et cetera. Um, by 2017, uh, e-cigarettes have become the most common use of uh, tobacco-like products in, in adolescents, and uh, 1.3 million uh, uh, new adolescents are, are using, uh, uh, you know, the, in 2017. That continues to escalate. By 2018, over 3.6 million U.S. youth are using uh, uh, electronic cigarettes, and one out of five high schoolers and one out of 20 middle schoolers have tried uh, electronic cigarettes, and so it's very common fold, commonplace. And, and uh, you know, if you talk to your kids, I think uh, you'll find that most of them have either tried vaping, whether they'll admit that or not, or know somebody that has. And and uh, and it can be nicotine. You can use marijuana. Um, you know, and so we'll we'll talk about that as well. So this is what a, a vaping device looks like, an e-cigarette or vape pen. Um, and so you have uh, really four principal components to, to any of these devices. There's a heater, or I'm sorry, a battery here that powers the device, uh, and then a heating element, um, and then you're, you put in a chamber, uh, you know, these different vaping oils uh, or, or vape uh, liquids. Um, and it, it heats the, uh, the liquid and atomizes it, and then it's inhaled through a mouthpiece. And so um, that's, uh, that's how the, uh, the devices work. And there's tons of stuff out there. They, there's different shapes and sizes. And uh, this is an article I found from 2014. And so we've come a long way since then. I would imagine this number is much, much higher. But back in uh, 2014, somebody decided to to actually do sort of a, a count and, and published an article uh, in a Tobacco Control Magazine, I never or, 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 or a publication. I didn't know there was such a publication, but uh, and there are 460 brands of e-cigarettes already at that time, and so I would imagine it's much higher now. And a lot of these uh, different. Uh, you know, uh, vaping oils are sort of targeted to kids. So here's an example I pulled off the internet. These are different fruit flavors. Um, we actually hospitalized a gentleman here with pretty severe uh, acute lung injury from smoking Mario Kart, and so it's uh, it's uh, it's a THC derivative uh, vape oil um, that that's uh, sold on the internet. Uh, it's pretty widely available. I think they advertised that it wasn't for the casual smoker. It was a little more potent. Um, and but you can see it, it looks like a you know the basically the Nintendo characters from Mario Brothers, and so it kind of appeals to kids as well. Um, there's also something called dabbing. You might hear that term uh, thrown around. And so dabbing um, is a more concentrated THC, and so um, it's a, it's a way to deliver a more concentrated hit of THC from the vape pen. And so there's different ways to uh, um, to uh, to deliver it, and, and dabbing, you get more uh, sort of the hallucinogenic effects, et cetera. Um, so I pulled this from The Guardian, and this is only two years old. And so I mentioned that you see stuff in the lay press and in the, in the, uh, out in the community, and it says, uh, the evidence is piling up. E-cigarettes are definitely safer than smoking. And so again, I would caution uh, you against uh, that message because um, you know there's really minimal data on the long-term effects of uh, vaping. And so I think the absence of, of long-term data does not equate to safety. It's, uh, and we certainly 
certainly know that there's, there's uh, demonstrable uh, immediate uh, effects, and we know that these things uh, cause adverse effects on your vascular system. Um, they can have respiratory uh, complications, and so I, I think it's, uh, it's very misleading to say that, we, uh, that they're definitely safer than smoking. Um, and, and again, this, I titled this one, if, if electronic cigarettes are so safe, then why all the ED visits? And so you can say, see, uh, like in 2017, even before the Evale uh, sort of um, uh, epidemic takes off, which hit its peak here in September of 2019, there were still a fair amount of, uh, of ER visits for vaping-related illness. And so, and if you go back in time, there were case reports of uh, something similar like acute lung injury related uh, you know, presentations because of electronic cigarette use that predated uh, uh, the, you know, when uh, things really sort of heated up in the, in the uh, kind of like 2019 timeframe. And you can see they remain elevated. You know, this was published in the New England Journal, I think in the late 2019. And there was still a fair amount of, uh, of visits. And the MMWR reports um, are updated on a regular basis. And, uh, and, uh, and they, they, you know, they still show that there's a fair amount of ER visits and patients being hospitalized with, with vaping-induced uh, acute lung injury still. Um, so there's a lot of uh, known adverse effects of electronic cigarette use. So the pulmonary stuff tends to be what we focus on the most. Um, and so there's, you know, different, like again, vaping related acute lung injury. There's an increased risk of respiratory tract infections, um, increased airway hyperreactivity. So when you're asthmatics, um, you know, patients can get chronic coughs, they can uh, exacerbate their asthma. There's also cardiovascular effects. There's been studies that show an increased uh, rate of, of sort of vascular reactivity and platelet aggregation. And those are some of the, the things that can lead to uh, myocardial infarction and things that later on. Um, and, and they actually mention increased odds of myocardial infarction. These devices can malfunction, so there's thermal injuries uh, that have been reported because of that. And then there's psychosocial effects, and so I won't, I won't delve into that too much because uh, you know, that's not necessarily my area of expertise, but it's something that we certainly deal with in clinic. Um, you know, I'm, I see patients, and I, I had this very discussion. It was a, a young patient I treat for pulmonary hypertension, and he was vaping, and the nurses were like, he's vaping, he's vaping, we gotta talk to him. And so we were talking to him, and he's like, well, what do I do? Should I go out and buy a pack of American spirits because uh, that, that seems to be safer? And I was a little bit at a loss, and so I'm interested to see how to, you know, to deal with it. Because I was, I was like, honestly, you know, me telling you to smoke, I just, as a physician, can't bring myself to do that, and I, I don't think it's a good recommendation. It's like giving you the choice between cocaine and heroin. You know, I think neither one of these things is good for you, and so for me to, to say either one of them is okay or that I give my permission for it, I, I think is sort of disingenuous, and that we need to talk about what you can do to try and quit as opposed to, uh, you know, telling you that one's okay or better than the other or trying to sort of weigh, weigh the odds of, of one versus the other. Um, you know, again, uh, the, there's that dual use that goes along with the psycho, psycho, psychosocial effects and then increased risk of, um, of other, um, uh, you know, uh, products like, like cannabis and, uh, and tobacco, alcohol, other illicit drugs. Um, there's a number of uh, types of uh, acute lung injury that have been reported as well. And so um, lipoid pneumonia, there's something called hypersensitivity uh, pneumonitis. It's like an uh, inflammation, almost like an allergic response in your lungs. Uh, eosinophilic pneumonia. And so I won't bore you with the, with the broad laundry list. They, they're very meaningful to a, me as a pulmonologist. You know, we have this like alphabet soup that we, we get very worked up as to what the uh, varying. But all of these things can cause respiratory failure. All of them can make you very sick. All of them can land you in the hospital. And so I think that's sort of the message that I would convey that um, and then it's not just one thing. It's not that they found some oil and that's the thing that's responsible. We're going to remove that and then vaping is not going to cause lung injury anymore. Um, we, we know that that's not the case either and I'll, I'll delve into that in a little bit more. And so that, that sort of leads me to Evali. And so what, what is that? So that's, you know, they started noticing a cluster of cases of patients with uh, vaping-induced lung injury in about March of 2019. But as I mentioned, there, there were cases reported sporadically earlier than that. And it just took time for there to be enough 
sort of density of cases and, and patients that, that, it, that it really created enough of a blip that it got a lot of attention, and then they really tried to figure it out. And, and so it hits its peak incidence in September 2019, and uh, despite the decrease, again, there's, these cases still go on, and, so, and, and we've sort of identified uh, vitamin uh, E uh, acetate oil as, as like one of the problems and, and a, certainly a big risk factor for it, but even with removing that, the cases go on. And so it's a, it's been sort of a big deal. There's been over 2,700 cases as of February 4th. That's the most updated data per the CDC who's tracking this closely, and 64 deaths. And so about, uh, you know, a little over 2% of the patients that develop this that are sick enough to seek medical attention and get reported to the CDC actually die from it despite, you know, presumably cessation of, of the vaping device while they're hospitalized and, and appropriate treatment uh, and supportive care, you know, even with the best care we can provide some of these patients are going to die as a consequence of this, uh, of this uh, condition. And so you can see there has been, you know, there was quite a peak, and these are hospital admissions by the week, and this starts in February and ends in uh, January 2020, um, but there's still, still patients coming in and being hospitalized. Um, I can tell you we did a transplant evaluation on a young man uh, last, last month, one of my colleagues, um, who had uh, vaping associated uh, lung, lung injury and just hadn't recovered. And so, um, so it, it remains a problem. Um, in terms of demographics, I, I, you know, this is uh, from the MMWR. Like, there's a couple things we could probably pull out of this. Uh, Males more common than females. I think that's a, a fairly common pattern that you see for a lot of high risk behaviors and sort of males are generally, uh, you know, you know, but, but, but certainly females aren't completely off the hook. About a third of the cases were, uh, were, in, were in women. Um, it tends to be the younger population, which again, I think is just mostly, a, a, you know, those are the people that are vaping primarily. Most of the smokers, by the time you hit uh, 45 or older, you're probably committed to smoking more so than vaping, although are, there are people that have been counseled to start vaping to try and quit smoking and use it as a, a means of smoking cessation. And so um, there's, there's uh, patients uh, in that group, but the, but the vast majority are young people. Um, it was predominantly Caucasians, um, you know, although a fair, uh, fair amount of uh, Hispanics and other ethnicities. And I don't think that this is an, uh, uh, a condition that respects ethnicity. I would imagine there's, you know, socioeconomic reasons that, that this is the, the reason that, that this distribution exists. But I think uh, regardless of your race and, uh, and um, most of the Afri or most of the patients I've taken care of here with vaping induced lung injury were African American, um, and then uh, the majority of patients uh, it was from some use of a THC containing product. And again, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the, pay, uh, the people that are vaping, um, you know, they're not doing THC specifically. The, the, if, you're, if you're smoking weed out of a, you know, vape pen, you're likely smoking nicotine products out of it as well. And so they're sort of interchangeable. But most of the cases when they tracked it back, 82% of them uh, had, had used some sort of THC derivative product. And so, um, you know, this is a, a slide on the presentation and, uh, you know, in terms of time of use. And so it can happen really any time. Most of the cases were early. I think a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, reported cases are getting in young people. They're starting to, to pick it up. And you see that with cigarette smoking as well. There's a condition called eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, you know, when the, when the Gulf War took off, there were a lot of cases reported with that. And it had to do with using starting to pick up smoking as a habit because they were bored and, and overseas or changing brands, et cetera. And so uh, we see the same sort of thing with cigarette smoking. And so you introduce some new exposure to your lung, but you can be an experienced vapor with uh, over three years of use and some of those patients are gonna be affected as well. Um, there it didn't really matter which device you use, you know, so e-cigarettes, these reviews, reusable devices for liquids, uh, vape rigs, there's vaping salts, there's all kinds of different things out there. All of them can cause vaping-induced lung injury. And then, um, you know, the brand doesn't seem to matter either. And so these are uh, the ones that I pulled out of. This was... Um, uh, a, a case series from, from Utah where they reported on about 64 different cases or so and, uh, of patients. And you can see they're a pretty broad distribution in terms of the brand. And so Juul is the one I think that's most uh, popular in the lay press and you, and you hear the most about. You know, they prime, their marketing is 
really for nicotine products, although you can, you can use a Juul device to smoke uh, you know, THC-containing oils uh, just as easily. Um, but you can see there's a whole bunch of different things. Most of them sort of geared toward THC. Um, but again, the, the, it doesn't matter what, what it's marketed for or intended for. They could tell you uh, it's for any of those things, and you can use it for THC or for nicotine. And so how do these patients present? Almost all of them, and because it's a lung disease, have respiratory symptoms, 98%. Um, you know, and most have shortness of breath, cough, chest pain. Uh, some patients cough up blood, about 12%. There's a lot of uh, pretty severe abdominal pain and gastrointestinal side effects. That was something I was surprised about taking care of some of these patients here. Um, and so pretty prominent abdominal pain to the point where we did abdominal CTs and things. There's been reports of um, kind of air in the bowel wall or in the, in the stomach, uh, what they, uh, and, um, and then nausea and vomiting. And then most of them have kind of general constitutional symptoms. They have fevers, chills, weight loss, fatigue. Um, you know, those are all sort of features of the illness, but it's a pretty nonspecific thing. You could think somebody has the flu if they're walking in with this. So I think it's important for clinicians to think about vaping and ask about it. You know, I think the respiratory symptoms will be more prominent, um, but again, somebody with bad influenza pneumonia could look this way as well. Um, so this is that same case series, and it just gives you a sense of the severity of the illness. And so, they, you know, 60 patients, 90% of them had to come into the hospital. Of those, 55% were admitted to the ICU. Almost all of them needed oxygen, about 88%. And 47% of them required something called high-flow oxygen, where you can deliver really 40% or higher um, uh, oxygen. Um, 28% required something called non-invasive ventilation. It's um, basically like the one step below putting a breathing tube in somebody and putting them on a mechanical ventilator. And 17% required mechanical ventilation. And, and pretty consistent with what's been recorded nationwide, um, despite really aggressive care. And, and Utah has an excellent medical system. Um, you know, 3% of the patients died. And, and they, they were in you know, very good hospitals with getting excellent supportive care. Um, of the patients that did make it home, 29% left the hospital still on oxygen, and so it can be slow to resolve or you can not recover all your lung function, and 10% of the patients had to be readmitted. So these are some radiographic examples. This is an x-ray, and it's a, uh, a little bright up here, but there's kind of these hazy infiltrates on both sides. That's the right lung and left lung, and this is the shadow of the heart and kind of diaphragms. And this is a CAT scan kind of cut, uh, you know, to look more like a chest x-ray. And you can see, really, this is what normal lungs should look like, nice and dark with these little tiny white blood vessels. Uh, and this patient's got these prominent um, uh, infiltrates that are centered around airways, and that sort of gives you a sign that it's an inhalational uh, type injury, what we call bronchiolocentric uh, infiltrates, meaning, you know, so your lung is reacting to what you inhaled. And so, um, and this is a different way of looking at it. This is a patient that had pretty severe uh, evali, and then four weeks later with stopping, uh, stopping vaping, which is probably, probably the primary intervention, and some steroids, you can see all these infiltrates uh, for the most part cleared up. And so fortunately, that's often the case, but that's, this is not a guarantee. Um, so how do we treat it? Again, the big cornerstone of treatment is to avoid the exposure. So these patients shouldn't be smoking anything. Cigarettes, they shouldn't be vaping anymore. We oftentimes will treat with corticosteroids. A lot of times while you're figuring it out, the patients are on antibiotics, but this isn't really an infectious thing. And so the antibiotics are more kind of covering all your bases, um, but it doesn't really necessarily add to, or to speed the resolution or, or help patients. Supportive care with oxygen, ventilators, et cetera, uh, if needed. Um, and again, there's variable rates of and, uh, and time of, uh, to resolution. Um, this, this doesn't project that well because it's black and white. That's the way they published it. But this is uh, the gross pathology of the first patient that died from uh, Evali. And so, um, you know, their lung, you can see all the, the discoloration here. And, uh, you know, this should be a big, like a pink, um, you know, beautiful lung in a young person. And this looks like something we took out of one of our uh, uh, post-transplant patients, like the explant before the new lung goes in. And so pretty severe uh, uh, lung injury. 
And so, you know, what causes it? Again, uh, this was published in New England Journal last year, and they did bronchoscopy. So you put a little camera down into somebody's lung and you squirt some fluid in and remove it, and you can look for infection, you can look at the cell counts, you can look for other things. And so they found in 48 of 51 cases that there was this vitamin E acetate, uh, which, you know, can cause sort of a, uh, what they call as a lipoid pneumonia, like a, a response to this oil. And so th this was in a lot of the the THC solutions that were uh, that uh, were causing the E Valley, even with uh, sort of cracking down on that and and companies sort of wising up, you know, again uh, the the problem continues though, and so not all cases were linked to that, and uh, and again there's been it's been something that's been going on for a while and continues to go on. Um, so I think you know a couple take-home messages for you. The only thing you should breathe into your lungs is fresh air. You know. Vaping's not good for you. Smoking's not good for you. Trying to make some sort of value judgment on what's better for me, I think, is a little disingenuous and, and it's tough to do. Um, electronic cigarettes, uh, short of the the effects they have, you know, this like immediate life-threatening issues that that can happen. You know, they have a lot of detrimental effects on on your health, and uh, and they're associated with an increased use of cigarette smoke and other drugs. And so. Um, just uh, wanted to plug a couple things before I, I turn it over to Dr. Mirza. So I know that has a smoking cessation program. This information's up here, um, and, and you know it's a, a self self pay uh, thing, forty five dollars. Um, and it, there's a lot of different times. And the numbers are here, um, and then they have other means of getting uh, help with uh, quitting smoking. And so there's our smoking cessation program. There's quit lines. There's a, a mobile app you can use. Um, there's something called I know the uh, Well Quit Coach, and so a lot of resources out there. And so our uh, respiratory therapy uh, team is very proud of our smoking cessation program. They really work hard when they uh, when they meet patients in the hospital or or when patients are coming to pulmonary rehabilitation um, to try and uh, get help them quit smoking. But um, with that, I'll turn it over. All right, so my name is Dr. Mirza. Uh, we're gonna have some objectives, some outlines of what we're trying to do today. Uh, talk about myself a little bit. Um, what's addiction? That's a big basis kind of, you know, even before we get down to the vaping itself, what is addiction, right? What are some of the biological factors of addiction that are involved? What's dopamine? We hear the word dopamine tossed around a whole bunch, so what is it? Um, environmental factors of disease or of addiction. And then ACEs, so adverse childhood effects. So what leads somebody down this pathway in the first place. And then rethinking addiction, rethinking what we want to do with that. And then again, vaping, I think Dr. King did a fantastic job of describing what vaping is, so I'll bust through that real quick. And then also kind of why are youth so susceptible to it? Why has it become such this huge issue recently? Um, and what we can do to help. So, you know, before we start, this is for adult eyes only, 100% without a doubt for adults only not of nicot legal, legal nicotine buying age, 100%, again, adults only, definitely not directed towards people under 21, okay? It would be totally illegal to market a product, or, you know, a presentation, sorry, towards somebody who would not use it appropriately, right? How dare anyone think that we could use something for somebody who's not able to use it legally? <clears throat> With that, right? <laughs> Myself, so I'm board certified in psychiatry, child adolescent psychiatry, and addiction medicine. A um, few jobs, I work at the Nova Keller Center, working primarily, so that's the uh, child and adolescent psychiatric facility or a psychiatric um, outpatient clinic for people um, in the Fairfax County and Loudoun County. We have two offices in Fairfax, or in, the other one is in Loudoun. Uh, my own practice as well, I focus primarily on addictions and adults, and I also work with the Wizards through the National Basketball Players Association through for them. No financial disclosure, sadly. One day. So, what's addiction? Addiction is originally from the 16th century, derived from the Latin word adicere or addictio, denoting a person's proclivity or inclination towards something. Uh, Merriam-Webster is, is, says it's a compulsive, chronic, physiological or psych psychological need for a habit-forming substance, behavior, or activity having harmful physical, psychological, social effects, and typically causing well-defined symptoms, such as anxiety, irritability, tremor, or nausea upon withdrawal of the substance, the state of being addicted, a strong inclination to do, use, or indulge in something repeatedly. 
Now we're going to talk about some of the biological factors of addiction as a whole. So we have a brain disease model of what addiction is as a whole. It's much more complex than previously thought. The original thinking was that this was a moral choice or moral failure. And we have to rethink the way that we're looking at addiction to kind of really help out with it the most. So it's not a moral choice. It's not a moral failure. There's genetic components, environmental factors that cause physical changes in the brain that promote that addiction process. Um, there was a paper done in 2016, so a few years ago. We kind of redescribe what the brain sees model of addiction is. So desensitization of the reward circuits of the brain, increased condition responses related to the substance an individual is dependent upon, and also declining function of brain regions that facilitate decision-making and self-regulation. So all the things that go into what addiction is per se. So Dr. Koop, he's a director of the NIH's National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, so that's related to everything we're talking about today. Common misperception is that addiction is a moral choice or moral problem. On all you have to do is to stop. How often do we hear that from people? So just stop smoking, just stop drinking, just stop using heroin, etc. It doesn't work. But nothing could be further from the truth. The brain actually changes with addiction, and it takes a good deal of work to get, get it back to its normal state. The more drugs or alcohol that you've taken, the more disruptive it is to the brain. So when we have healthy decision making, this is for example, when someone's having a good habit and now a positive kind of addiction in a way. Healthy behaviors like exercising, eating, sex, right, et cetera, release dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter in the brain. This is the make you feel great, right? Like Tony the Tiger over here. This is what says, this is great, let's do this again, right? So it's the motivation to repeat these behaviors. Um, sometimes we have danger situations, right? Our normal flight, fright, freeze to get out of danger. This is epinephrine, cortisol released from the adrenals. Remember that, we'll come back to it a little bit later. Um, tempting situations or difficult decisions, these go to the frontal part of our brain, frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, and this is where we kind of decide and make decisions. Is this a good thing to do? Is this a bad thing to do? When we have addicted kind of decision making, right? The same process is in place, but it works almost against you. Behaviors like drug use, alcohol, gambling, et cetera, can also release dopamine. So when you have a drink and you get a good feeling, dopamine is released. When you take a cigarette, smoking, vaping, et cetera, dopamine gets released. This kind of makes us feel like we have to do these behaviors again and again, because they release those neurotransmitters. So ability to appropriately sense danger becomes hypersensitive in effect. So when we have a stressful situation or when we, when the stressful situation is interpreted as not having access to smoking or drugs, gambling, et cetera, we kind of feel distress, anxiety, physical distress, et cetera. So we seek out these behaviors to kind of avoid distress, um, as well as we do these things to not necessarily to get pleasure from them anymore, but to avoid the distress feeling. Okay, And also we have danger to our frontal lobe and our prefrontal cortex. This leads us to make poor decision making over and over and over again. So we go back to dopamine, right? Dopamine, there's three main tracks in the brain that are involved in the dopamine reward pathway. The mesocortical, nigrostriatal, the mesolimbic pathway. Don't have to worry about that, guys, but just know it's rewards, okay? A uh, flood of dopamine leads to pleasure, the rush, and the reward. Okay, uh, so we talked about that. So rewards as a whole, and this comes back to psychology and sound of learning as well. Something called reward prediction error, so or in, in encoding. So that's in our uh, brain, and it's dopamine dopamine mediated feedback signals in our brain. Uh, this is kind of the basis, the psychological basis behind something like slot machines. Okay, if we're in a casino and we're sitting on a slot machine and we pull that lever. There's an anticipation that comes with, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. And sometimes, you know, like this guy over here, even though he's playing, what was this game called? I forgot what the game was. Yeah, press your luck, right? He's hoping, he's praying that the dopamine is coming, that something's going to, he's going to win the game, right? And every once in a while he wins, right? And you get that reward from it, and then you're like, let's do this again, right? Um, also, the best kind of reward that we found was that there's something called a variable reward schedule back in B.F. Skinner. He was a psychologist back in the 30s. 
um, those are shown to be the most effective. And what that means is, you know, every once in a while, you're going to randomly get a reward, right? The best way that I kind of explain this, and you know, we just had Valentine's Day recently, right? So if I know, if my wife knows that every Valentine's Day I'm going to get her flowers, it feels pretty good, right? But the reward of it kind of diminishes over time. Seven years into marriage, it's like, all right, cool, I got flowers on Valentine's Day. If I show up randomly in like March 2nd and I buy her flowers, it's a surprise. And she feels great because she just got flowers out of nowhere and it feels good, right? So this is again, kind of comes back to the dopamine activity, right? When we get a reward that's expected, the reward from it kind of diminishes. But when we get that unexpected reward, it recircuits everything. A negative prediction error essentially says that when we have a negative outcome, right? So when we pull those slots, right? and we lose, we lose, we lose, we lose, eventually, hopefully, in theory, for most people, is that that desire to kind of pull the slot the next time goes away. So dopamine intolerance, right? So again, kind of come back to that. Consistent behaviors, whether positive or negative, lead to overstimulation, right? So that reward path of our brain gets very stimulated over and over again. Um, it comes overwhelmed, it can't handle it, doesn't know what to do. So the reward center has to Accommodate the brain adapts physically changes or adapts so that dopamine goes down a little bit the production of it if the, the internal production of dopamine decreases and the receptors have to kind of be reduced as well to be able to handle all that reward that's happening So the behavior then has over time right has less effect due to weaker response by the reward center right essentially meaning that we need more and more of the same stimulus to get that same reward right the cravings, you know, are they going to go on? Something that we look for. People who quit using a substance or quit doing something, there's that need or that desire to do it again and again. So D2 receptors are dopamine receptors that are in the brain. They're found in part of the brain. They're responsible for the concept of delayed gratification. There is a famous study that was done involving children, right, and putting a marshmallow in front of them. Essentially, what the, the idea with the, behind the, the study was that um, they basically gave like a six-year-old, seven-year-old and put a marshmallow in front of them and said, I'm going to leave this marshmallow in front of you. You can eat it right now, or it can wait two minutes, and I'm going to give you two marshmallows, right? For most of those five-year-olds and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds, how many times do you think they were able to make those two minutes? Hardly ever, right? <laughs> That idea of delayed gratification, so that comes a little bit later as the brain develops a little bit more. So for teenagers, adults, there it makes sense to be like, let me wait two minutes. I'm gonna get two marshmallows. That's great. So this comes back to the dopamine and the rewards and everything associated with that. So people who have um, what the studies were showing is that there's lower dopamine response in the D2 receptors, and this leads to impulsivity and short-term reward behavior. Some people are genetically predisposed to have lower or higher responses to dopamine as a whole. So some people are intrinsically born to be more reward-seeking or less reward-seeking, be able to have that immediate response or to kind of say, I can wait, right? Um, also, this can come about from repeated substance use, right? The more that we use a substance, that response to it kind of decreases over time, okay? So the child and the adolescent brain, so the brain that's really important is that the brain develops until we're around 25 years old, right? And, you know, we talk about adolescence as being 18 and you're an adult. And we still got six, seven years, right? But we're still, the brain is developing, right? Um, all that time is, it's, you know, it's very important during those time because the brain is the most impressionable brain this, during this stage of development. Any sort of impact or insult or injury is magnified as compared to what it is to adults, okay? It's basically you're rewiring it. So some of the environmental factors of addiction. So that's, you know, we talked about some of the biological issues. So let's talk a little bit more about environment and what that actually means. The big thing is trauma. Um, and a trauma is the, is the thing in the room that nobody talks about as much. 70% of Americans have had at least one traumatic event. There are some studies that show that. Um, and trauma is defined as a response to one or multiple events that are physically or emotionally harmful or threatening. They're often long-lasting impact on individuals, communities, um, families, if they're all left unaddressed. 
Outcomes are mental illness, substance use disorders, and physical health conditions. And this brings us to this very landmark study, um, ACEs, or the Adverse Childhood Effect Experiences. This was done between 95 and 97, uh, done through the CDC and Kaiser, Kaiser the insurance com company, um, done in Southern California. Over 17,000 individuals were involved in the study. So this is not like, you know, 10 people. Um, these were confidential surveys that were done during routine physical exams. So again, they were not necessarily coming in for any particular reason. They were just, hey, you're coming into the door. Let's just fill out some questions and kind of get some information. There are three main issues that they were looking at. They were looking at abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction, and the effect that it would have later on in life. Interesting thing about it is that the key demographics were those that 50%, 54% of the uh, respondents were female. About 75% were white. About 50 over about 50 percent were over 60 years old, and over 75 percent had either some college or college graduate. So when we think of bad things happening to people, right, traumatic events, we think of people in lower socioeconomic statuses, right. Um, so this goes totally opposite to that, right. This is everybody and anybody, right. So what we're going to do right now is just going to quickly kind of run through what the questions are. Uh, just ask everybody to kind of keep a running tally for yourself, and let's find out what your ACE score is, okay? And we'll see what happens, or what could potentially happen, and then you can kind of reflect. So this is going to be all before your 18th birthday. Did a parent or adult in your household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, humiliate you, or act in a way that made you feel afraid that you might be physically hurt? Same question. So parent or adult in the household before you're 18, this one, right? Push, grab, slap, or throw something at you. Ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured, right? Question number three. Did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or have you touched their body in a sexual way? Attempt or actually have oral, oral anal, vaginal intercourse with you, right? Sexual abuse. Fourth question. Did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you, or you thought you were important, or thought you were important or special? Your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other? Before your 18th birthday, question number five, did you often or very often feel you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, or had no one to protect you? Parents were too drunk or too high to take care of you or take you to the doctor if you needed it. Six, right? Was a biological parent ever lost to you through divorce, abandonment, or any other reason? Okay. Number seven, was your mother a stepmother? We had a presentation on this earlier today at, a, at the Keller Center. Often, very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, had something thrown at her. Sometimes often or very often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard. Ever repeatedly hit over at least a few minutes or threatened with a gun or knife? Before your 18th birthday, did you live with anyone who has a, was a problem drinker or alcoholic or use street drugs? Number nine, was a household member depressed or mentally ill? Or did a household member ever attempt suicide? The last question was, did a household member ever go to prison? Okay, so hopefully everybody kind of internally, you know, keep it to yourself kind of thing, was able to have some sort of running total of what their ACE score is. And these were the findings. First thing is ACEs are incredibly common, okay? 36% had none. That means 64% had at least one, okay? Score of one was 26%, score of two was 16%, score of three was nine and a half percent. A score of four plus was 12 and a quarter percent, 12.4 percent, so pretty high amount, right? That's more than one in 10 had four plus significantly, you know, significant stressors in their life. Childhood abuse is common, right? 20% sexually abused, 30% physically abused, 10% emotionally abused. And this, these scores do not take into account necessarily that these events are as singular events. So if you were abused 25 times, that counts as one, right, for physical abuse. Sexual abuse, it could be your entire lifetime, your entire 18 years of sexual abuse, for example, right? And that would count as number one, right? So the outcomes of that. So what happens to people with ACEs, right? 
People with some sort of an ACE, the 64% of people, two to four times more likely to use substances early, meaning before 18, before 21. ACEs were for four plus. They have health outcomes as well, right? And mental health issues, right? Twice as likely to have cancer or heart disease. Seven times as likely to have alcohol use disorder. 12 times as likely to have attempted or die of suicide. These are big numbers, right? If you have five plus on your ACE score, you're 10 times more likely to struggle with addiction. And they redid this again in 2011, 2014, and they saw that very consistent, right? Zero was about 38%, four or more was 16%, so actually pretty, pretty high, okay? So changes in viewing addiction, because again, we have this moral view that's been around for so long, right? So Dr. Simrock, he is a doctor at the Center for Addiction Studies at University of Tennessee, Health and Sciences College at College of Medicine. He says addiction should not be called addiction per se. It should be called ritualized compulsive comfort seeking. Okay? And then ritualized compulsive comfort seeking, which traditionally is called addiction, is a normal response to the adversity experienced in childhood. Just like bleeding is a normal response to being stabbed. Right? The solution, the solution to changing the illegal or unhealthy ritualized compulsive comfort seeking behavior, um, and this is saying addiction, opioid addiction, but also any kind of addiction in general, is to work through individually and in group therapy, treat people with respect, treat them medically appropriately. So this is, again, using buprenorphine for opioids, but nicotine replacement or other medications for nicotine, per se, and help them find a ritualized compulsive comfort-seeking behavior that won't kill them or put them in jail. Right? Got to find something else to do. So we look at addiction in DSM-5. So DSM is what we use in psychiatry. This is our, the Bible of psychiatry, but you know, it's all our diagnoses in there. And like Superman, we're looking around for it and we can't find the word addiction there, right? So the term addiction is not used in the DSM-5. We use substance use disorders instead, opioid use disorder, cannabis use disorder, nicotine or tobacco use disorder. Um, this is felt to be more descriptive. So nicotine and vaping in teens. So I'll, I'll kind of go through this a little bit quickly because Dr. Um, King did a fantastic job with it. Um, but addiction pathway, when, we, when someone has cigarette or a vape or whatever it's going to be to kind of get nicotine, the thing that's really important to see is that the nicotine goes through all these cycles, right? So the nicotine goes to the lungs um, and then to the adrenals. Adrenals release epinephrine, cortisol, et cetera, and then to the brain. And that takes 10 seconds. Okay, that process is very fast. So the brain then accommodates and has a release of acetylcholine, which is another neuroreceptor, which involves dopamine. So this is a very quick process that happens, right? And based on the thing that's important, the, the regulation based on exposure, the more that we smoke, the more that the acetylcholine receptors are there, the more that once we stop, we have a decrease in those receptors. So that's why. Like Dr. King was saying, if we're able to stop cessation or, or decrease or stop the smoking, we can reverse these effects pretty quickly. Dopamine goes through the liver, or nicotine goes through the liver, and then these cravings and cues start over again. And cravings and cues come from anything. Um, how many people have teens over here? Right? How many people, how many of those teens go to the bathroom at school to actually go to the bathroom? None of them. I don't think I've ever heard one time any of my patients say they went to the bathroom at school to go to the bathroom. They go to the bathroom to smoke, right? They go to the bathroom to use whatever drugs they are. It's there, every school, right? So if for some you know, reason they have to go to the bathroom, you know, and they have to pee, and they go there, and somebody's smoking a vape in there, it triggers the whole cycle again, because they see it, they smell it, something really happens and they have to go, and they feel like cravings come all over again. Vaping, same picture, right? Conlick, he makes it in 2003. He made it because he was a, you know, he was a, his father was dying of lung cancer. His father did die of lung cancer. He's a pharmacist, it's interesting to know, right? He was concerned about his own mortality, and he was smoking three packs per day, so he needed to find something different. And that's how the vaping kind of started. Um, in theory, Right? That was the idea and the philosophy behind it. It takes care of the 7,000 harmful chemicals that come by uh, production of smoking and combustion in cigarettes or other tobacco products. It reduces them to something that still would be 
fill up the entire PowerPoint slide, but it's less than 7,000, right? <laughs> so in theory, again, it's a delivery met method for nicotine and anything else, like we know in reality, THC, et cetera, uh, marijuana, et cetera. Marketed, again, as a way to quit smoking, and the interesting thing is, of course, it's not FDA approved for smoking cessation. Um, same thing, cartridge, heating element, power source, the mouthpiece, this is a jewel. Uh, puffing is activates the heating element, which vaporizes the liquid which users inhaling an aerosol. So we call it vaping, but we're not actually inhaling vape, right? There's a difference between, or vapor, sorry. When we boil water, that's water vapor, right? And that's not the same thing as what's created when we're using a vapor or using a vape. We're creating an aerosol. Aerosol is like what comes in a spray can, right? So when we spray something, there's residue that comes along with it. There's other chemicals that are associated with it. There's propellants that are involved in it. So it's not, even if the, the name vaping is a misnomer, right? Vaping, vaping among teens. Um, the main thing to, you know, one of the big things is that the stop smoking campaign worked, right? People don't smoke cigarettes as much anymore, significantly much less than they used to. The idea of smoking cigarettes is repulsive to a lot of teens. They're like, I would never smoke a cigarette, but vaping isn't smoking, quote unquote, right? Research indicates that some teens do not even know that vaping contains nicotine. They just think it contains flavor or other things like that. Flavor is galore. There are so many flavors, right? It doesn't smell, right? Cigarettes have a very distinct smell. Um, so it doesn't have that stink. It's easy to conceal. You'll hear it all the time. People will whip out this thing that looks like a flash drive, take a quick puff in there while their teacher's writing something on the board. Nobody knows. A lot of times with teens, it's the first introduction to other more harmful smoking. So there was a study that showed that seven times more likely to start smoking cigarettes within six months of starting vaping, okay? Primes the brain for reward, like we talked about, reward, dopamine, all that stuff. Other illicit substances like marijuana, cocaine, and methamphetamine. Again, developing brains are affected primarily in the areas of attention and focus and learning. So we see mood disorders like depression, as well as anger and impulse control, right? Withdrawal symptoms in, of nicotine in teens is like pretty violent, right? Extreme anger, destruction of property, deviant behavior. We see here like almost every day. You know, my kid was never like this before. We took the vape away and then they were putting holes in the wall, breaking doors, right? The other thing, like, again, like Dr. Kim talked about, was that there's more um, non-nicotine substances in vaping as well. Um, Marina Picciotta talked about PhD at Yale, talked about there's hope that the current vaping epidemic won't lead to major health problems like lung disease or lung cancer or pulmonary disease, but we may still see an epidemic of cognitive function problems and attention problems. Changes made in the brain could persist. So Julie. Created, you know, Jewel's the most one has become the most villainized, the one that has gotten the most press. Um, because it's kind of owned the market. Um, they've become almost like the Xerox of copy machines. Jewel's have become the jewel of e-cigarettes and other machines. Their predecessor to the Jewel, the modern Jewel, was designed to smoke cannabis. So we have to know, we have to know that. This was designed to smoke cannabis. The thing with the Jewel versus cigarette is there's significantly higher nicotine levels. So those are getting a lot more. We get something back from it. The reward circuit is, again, all thrown out of whack. The thing with the advertisements, they're definitely not, asterisk, directed towards teens, OK? <laughs> they capitalize on social media to enormous success, right? 2016, sales were increased by 700%. March 2018, it was, a, it was described as a high school epidemic. April 2018, the threat it was identified as a threat to big tobacco. They were like, oh my god, what is going on over here? So Altria, you know, Philip Morris, they bought 35% of Juul, $12.8 billion in December of 2018. Summer of 2019, this fall, this is when we had the mar investigations into marketing and all the mysterious stats. So again, we're not marketing to teens. Not marketing into teens. Not marketing into teens. We're still not marketing to teens. Not marketing to teens. Not marketing to youth. Nope, nope. Not marketing to teens or, or, huge, or you know, children. I mean, is that a calculator? Is those like Fiskars, right? I mean, I'm not sure how many like grown, grown adults are using Fiskars nowadays, right? Not marketing to teens. Or not marketing to teens. Nope, not marketing to teens. Still not marketing to teens. Slumber parties. We're not marketing to teens. 
not marketing to teens, not marketing to teens, not marketing to teens, definitely not marketing to teens. That was through BuzzFeed, yeah. Not marketing to teens. Look at this guy. How old do you think, how old do you think this guy is? We're not marketing to teens, right? It's, you know, they, they, they jumped on and they, they really, they made their billions, right? Not marketing to teens. <laughs> Uh, the Truth Initiative, uh, they're one of the biggest anti-smoking campaigns. And by the way, those advertisements, that was the Stanford Research into Tobacco Advertising. That was just like the first one or two pages of like 200. Okay. Just get an idea of what's out there, right? E-cigarettes. Um, E-cigarette use increased amongst every age group of respondents. This is from just a few weeks ago, less than a month ago. Researchers found that current dual use was higher among youth than young adults, with 8.2% in 21 to 24, 12.8% in 18 to 20, and 7.8% in 15 to 17. Um, slant towards use among younger people is indicative of Juul's reliance on marketing tactics, historically used by tobacco industry to target young people. This other thing, you look at the marketing, and they're really just recycling the old tobacco ads, okay? 2019, more than half of all respondents who had ever used Juul had never used combustible tobacco before, suggesting that Juul appeals to young people who are at low risk for smoking, right? Never smoked before anything else, half of them, right? Um, certain demographics are at higher risk, whites, Hispanics, males, right? So we talked about whites, Hispanics, and males, and those identifying as LGBTQ. So how to help, right? Nicotine replacement is, is one of the biggest things we can do, right? Um, Over-the-counter stuff like gums, lozenges, those are 12-week kind of programs. Transdermal patches, eight to 10 weeks. Prescription, there are some nasal spray, three months. Oral inhaler, three to six months. Prescription medication, so bupropion, SR, or Zyban, which is a 12-week course. Varincycline, or varinicline, or Chantix, which is a 12-week course. You can use that as well. And therapeutic interventions. Individual therapy, such as motivational interviewing, where we took, look to talk about what are some of the behaviors that are there, the impact that it has. I see it all the time with athletes, high school athletes, who are like, I can't play basketball as well. I can't play football as well. All these things. And you know, when we're talking about sports and some of these kids who are looking to, try to get scholarships and things like that, these milliseconds and these inches make huge differences, right? And if they're huffing and puffing down the sideline, it's gonna affect their ability to kind of get to that next level or achieve where they wanna be doing. And trying to monopolize on that and really kind of get on that and really say, what's your motivation to continue to use? What has it done for you? What's it not doing for you? And where can we go from there? Cognitive behavioral therapy, we would look at to kind of correct some of our thinking. Trauma therapy, like we talked about all the trauma stuff before, right? And we wanna come back and kind of rework that and, and again, make new ways of coping and new reward pathways. Group therapy. Um, at Keller, we have uh, IOP, Intensive Outpatient uh, Program, with the SRD, Substance-Related Disorder Track. Recently, there's been a ro rollout of, this, of a Stanford-based education program on vaping. Really, the biggest thing is just education, 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 right? A lot of the people, parents and teens, don't know about all the stuff that's happening, right? Last part of the last slide was that the response to the program with, in regards to the education has been very enthusiastic. There's been a lot of eyes opened and a lot of discussion that's gone on from both uh, patients, clients that are involved in the therapy as well as the parents that are involved as well. So it's been making some, some good inroads so far. And that's what I got. I just want to know, are there any formalized programs that are coming into the middle and high school? I have a high schooler, and well, I guess they're both high school now, but last year my middle schooler would say things to me like, oh, mom, you know, all the things you said. There's no nicotine. It's not that bad. You know, and I, as a medical care provider, I'm trying to give education to him. And of course, your 15-year-old's like looking at you like you have four heads. So my question is, I mean, I know that teenagers don't like to listen to adults. I um, give anesthesia. And I can say that some of the things that I've seen in the operating room, lung transplants and things, it's dramatic when you see a lung that these aren't from vaping, you know, procedures, but 
this lung of a young man who's barely able to breathe coming into the operating room. And then you see this lung taken out. And, you see, and I see it. And then I see the new lung come in, and I see the pink. And all, everything is so, and it's dramatic. And, I, and maybe teenagers wouldn't respond to that, because I'm an adult and I look at things differently. But I really wish the schools could have programs and that there could be some type of pretty intense graphic pictures of what lungs look like. What, I mean, a child, you know, I love all the stuff you're talking about, like, you know, you can be on a ventilator. What does it mean to be on a ventilator? The average 15, 16 year old is like, oh, big deal, it's like on TV. They don't understand when you suction this patient, how they're coughing and bucking, and it's not pretty. And you know, they really need to see this stuff because they, they live in this world of, ah, it's not gonna happen to me. It happens every day. I see it in my profession, you guys see it. And, and no matter how hard you try to explain it to your teenager, they're just not listening. And I do think graphic pictures and really intense um, talks about it might help, maybe not, but this is just, this is my question. I mean, is there any program? I mean, some of the schools have somebody come. I know I think Oakton had somebody come and talk about vaping, I was not able to go. I wish I could have, but you know, that's to the parents. What about the, the kids? Because they need to hear it from someone besides their mom or dad who they really don't want to listen to. Okay, thanks. Um. I, you know, I don't. I don't know exactly what they do in the school system. I know that they sent this out of, as an invite to the Fairfax County Public School System. Um, I, you know, this seems totally crazy, but I, I understand. Like years ago, Jewel was actually going into schools and sort of marketing themselves, and schools were inviting them in. And so I think that was before the sort of valet thing took off. But uh, you know, that we've come a long way since then. I, I think. You know, I don't know, like, how do you change, like, high-risk behavior in kids? I think that's a, a big problem, because even if you beat teenagers over the head with, with something, I mean, adults, too, and, like, adults are not much better than, than teenagers, honestly. You know, they may be a little more responsible, um, but, uh, you know, people know stuff's bad for them, and, like, how do you convey that message and, and get them to not do it and think, you know, it's not going to happen to me? I, it's a real, it's a problem. I don't know, like, how to, I, I, I'd ask you probably that question. It's, it's a daily struggle. There's no doubt about that. Um, is this still going? Okay, yeah. Um, the major thing is, is, like we talked about, like I talked about, was the, the motivational interviewing. Really kind of see what's going on, what's driving the youth, and then kind of going from there. Um, I found in my experience that I get better success by, by not doing the whole here's pictures and here's slides and this is what's going to happen to you because we all know that and the teens and middle schoolers everybody has been exposed to it in, in some form or other right um but it's the it's very it's the non-judgmental talking to the individual talking to teens talking to our students face to face um i throw the die word around all the time right i have no problem saying it you know, I had somebody just last week who was drinking lean. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but you know, Sprite, Jolly Ranchers, and codeine cough syrup, right? And I say that there were rappers in Houston that were dying like on a weekly basis a couple of years ago, and people die from it all the time. So I don't say, oh, it, you know, something really bad is going to happen. I say the die word, right? And I talk about the fact that when we're talking about smoking and vaping and things, again, it's 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 an individual decision, right? And I say, you have the right to make a poor decision, but you have to understand what comes with it. Um, this is what's going to happen. This is what does happen all the time. When we have tobacco use, right, we know from all the research that half of all tobacco users will die from tobacco use. Right? That's just numbers, right? It's very similar to, the, to with nicotine, et cetera. And just breaking it down very financially, you know, when you break it down financially with people too, that you hit them where it hurts, right? So, a Jewel starter pack is fifty bucks, right? The refill pods are, you get ten or ten dollars for two pods and four pods for fifteen or sixteen bucks, right? And a pod is about a cigarette, or a, oh, sorry, one pod is about a pack of cigarettes, right? And say like, okay, fine, you want to do this? 
support it. You know, by that aspect, I'm not going to financially support you. So we see it a lot of times where parents are still enabling it by giving an allowance or giving some incentive to do it. So I say, parents-wise, take the power back, right? Let's say if you want to smoke, get a job. It's that aspect of kind of really saying, if you want to make this adult decision, be an adult and understand what's going to come with it. I mean, I, I do think having the conversation is, is probably worth doing. Even if you think your message won't land, I think it probably carries more weight than you realize. You know, and then for people that, that are smoking, a lot of the, like with vaping, uh, you know, I don't know that the approach that I take is much different than I, I would use with cigarette smoking. And kind of the speech that I give is, you know, no patch or pill is going to make you quit if you don't want to quit, you know, until you make your mind up. And a lot of it has to do with breaking the associations that, you know, the things that, that, you know, spark somebody to want to have a cigarette, like I'm having a long car ride, I'm drinking a cup of coffee. It's the thing I do when I wake up in the morning and read the paper and trying to figure out something else to do to replace some of those associations. I think a lot of those things, you know, picking a quick date, those are some of the things that have maybe been sort of uh, validated. And then the, the nicotine replacement piece of it is more of, the help with the physical addiction, but if you don't break that psychological connection, then you never make any make any headway. And so, and so, until somebody wants to do something, their you know medications don't don't help them quit. So, and to hop on to like Dr. Dr. King's thing at the end there, with it is the stages of change, and ultimately it is we need to be in a situation where we create enough kind of ambivalence or enough decision to kind of say, do I want to quit? Do I not want to quit? You know, we give the evidence, give information to kind of say, here's all the things that can happen. And we're hoping at some point in time, someone decides, okay, maybe I want to stop. Or I'm seeing something that happens. Again, I use it with athletes, right, all the time. We're not playing up to the level. Find something to show that it's affecting you. Even though you say it's not, it's doing something. And working from there. Uh, one quick plug. I. Um... Our, some members of our respiratory therapy team who are actually on like uh, help with the smoking cessation program are here and I believe have handouts right if uh, if people I see stuff in your hand if that, oh. uh, I didn't bring any of the smoking cessation handouts but they are available and um, they can be purchased and be obtained through the pulmonary rehab program so it's the pulmonary rehab program that runs Excuse me, we have one webinar question. Is there any odor that third parties can detect? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on what they're smoking. And like, uh, I think, the, you know, I don't think it has the same sort of uh, lasting sort of uh, residual odor that like a, a cigarette does where it's, you know, because it, you know, is more of a sort of water vapor type. Uh, but there, there is a smell associated with vaping. It, I don't think it hangs around quite as long. And I think depending on what you're smoking, it's, uh, you know, or, or vaping, that you know, the 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 scent will vary, um, you know. And it depends, I think, a lot on the flavors as well. Uh, some some of the more fruity flavors, the minty flavors, etc., which are common, have a bit more of a, a scent or an odor that lingers around a little bit more. The ones that are supposed to be unflavored or kind of classic kind of tobacco flavors may not linger along as much or? I've um, been able to obtain the phone number that someone can call if they are interested in the smoking cessation program. So I will give that out. 703-776-3392. For anyone interested in the smoking cessation program, 703 Seven seven six three three nine two. Hi, sorry. Just a quick question. Do we know yet whether smoking cessation programs and a vaping cessation are going to be the same for teens or whether there needs to be a different approach for teens who are vaping? It's similar because the it's ultimately it comes down to the, the nicotine that is the addictive element of smoking. Uh, so part of it is kind of that physiological, psychological, or the physiological, the you know the, the body kind of addiction that needs to be addressed in as well. 
Um, if, again, that's why we see a lot of these helpers amongst the teens that we work with sometimes is that they get violently aggressive because they need a break. We had somebody who was in our partial hospitalization program, uh, I want to say a month, two months ago, who was doing everything he could to get out of the program, right? So he could smoke, right? And, while, you know, and you know, part of it led to the point that he escalated. He said, I'm suicidal and I need to do this and et cetera. He got himself admitted to the hospital, right? You know, he, he, he got himself out of the program, but he stepped himself up to the hospital. But they will do whatever, right? You know, part of it is the element of, you know, and we did the patches for him. We were trying to get him to just do the patches. The days that he did it, he was okay able to tolerate the program for the day. He was inconsistent on his end to use the patches. The days that he didn't use the patches, there was a definite difference. I don't, I don't think there's any formal study that's been done looking at like vaping uh, cessation methods, you know, like where smoking or was kind of well-designed studies and they looked at a bunch of different things and different medications and what, what works best. I think we're applying a lot of the lessons learned from uh, sort of traditional smoking cessation programs and use of nicotine replacement. You know, I think the other thing would be if it's more THC products, then nicotine replacement doesn't have nearly as much of a role, right? So although most patients that smoke THC products also smoke nicotine uh, when they vape as well. So. The question is, is just the, a year ago. Yeah, are the smoking sensation products approved for people under 18 years of age? They were not as of a year ago. They're still not approved approved. Okay. There's a lot of things that are not approved that have to happen <laughs> that, that can occur. So in those situations when this is a focus of treatment, we do ask the, the parents to buy it for them mm -hmm. and then have them apply it or to use it kind of under supervision, you know, whether it's giving them the gum or, again, like I said, applying the packet patch. Thank you for that, because I'm a parent who went through this, continues to go through it, and when I started on this journey, nobody would even talk about these. Um, I found one pediatrician who would sort of say, well, you know, you could take a look at it, it's not approved. But, you know, parents do have to make their own choices in terms of what's going to work as a plan to help their child quit. And if some of this is gonna help their child, you gotta think about using it. I, I mean, you can think of it sort of physiologically too. If you have a, a pretty big teenage kid that's, that's like the same size as an adult and they're already smoking and being exposed to the adverse effects of smoking or, and nicotine, you know, I think that sort of lesser of two evils. I mean, if you have a, a 10 year old or something that, that was, uh, uh, using nicotine, I, then you may shy away from certain nicotine replacement products. I think, but uh, um, but I, you know, again, most most uh, I think teens that are in that situation are probably of of adult size, or you know, and so um, should metabolize it appropriately. And it's just not been studied in teens, and and so that's why the the restrictions. Can the second vape affect the third person who's not smoking? Yeah, uh, in the um, same way. So I think the question was, are there, just like there's secondhand smoke, is secondhand vaping uh, harmful? Um, there, again, there's not as much study, like we don't even know like uh, the effects, I think, of, of, um, of vaping fully. I think there's a potential for harm there, although the exposure wouldn't be nearly as great and so the like the likelihood of getting, say, like Evale from secondhand vaping expo exposure, I think, is quite small. And I don't, I don't, not aware of any reported cases of that. Um, but you know, I, it's probably not good for you to be around, you know, significant secondhand vaping exposure. There's, there's actually, um, there is secondhand exposure to nicotine vapor vape. Um, there's actually something called thirdhand as well. Um, and it comes down to ultimately the fact that it's not, again, a, a vapor that's being produced, it's a aerosol. So the way that I think about it, again, is if you have Febreze, Febreze is, is an aerosol, right? Any of those sprays. When we spray it on these couches or these chairs when we're done with them, there's something that's there. There's some residue chemicals, et cetera, that's there. 
It's the same thing with the vape smoke, per se. It's an aerosol, that's what's created, that's what makes it different, that's what makes it stick on fabric and couches and comforters, beds, whatever it's gonna be, cars, and that goes along with it. So all, and it's the other thing is that there's not just the nicotine, it's all the other things that are that are in the in that vapor, in that aerosol that's produced. The battery when it's heated up, the coils when it's sorry, the coil when it's heated up has like nickel and cadmium that's produced that goes along with it. Stuff that's in antifreeze, stuff that's in um, nail polish remover, there's all these other chemicals that are in that aerosol that, that goes out. One more question from the webinar. Are there any home testing kits to help detect whether or not a teenager might be vaping? Not to my knowledge. <laughs> I, I mean, I would think uh, if, if it's THC, you could, you could test for that eventually. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, nicotine testing kits, like there's something called uh, urine cotinine that you pick up with nicotine exposure uh, in cigarettes. There's probably a way to test for it. I don't know what over-the-counter kits are available, though. Sorry, just as a parent who's gone through this, um, you can go to Amazon and buy your um, testing strips, both for just for nicotine. You can get to there like three dollars each, and there are testing strips for THC that you can get. You have to read the, you have to understand that nicotine, well, THC tests the last thirty days, so that doesn't mean that they could have used it twenty nine and a half days ago and it'll still test positive. Nicotine, it's a shorter window. It's less it's like seven days, six or seven days. But as parents, um, we use it in our family to sort of randomly say there will be random testing. Um, and a lot of other parents I know do that as well. Uh, there's just a comment. For the parent asking what the schools are doing, Fairfax County Public Schools have substance abuse prevention specialists on staff. They should contact the school and talk to that person to find out what their school does. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Dr. Mursa. Um, I just, I guess I want a little bit more clarification when you talked about um, how to kind of motivate athletes was your example as far as um, finding out what areas, I guess, does smoking affect them? I was wondering if you could give an example of what um, an athlete's response would be to that. So what we're hoping is that they're, we're able to kind of see that the smoking in some way, shape, or form is affecting negatively their performance, athletically. Um, and again, I, like I said, I, I see with people who are football players, soccer players, they're just not able to run as much. They're not able to run as fast. Um, and it's, it's latching onto that idea and saying, what matters more to you? You know, does the smoking matter more to you or does the football matter more to you? Or does soccer matter more to you? and utilizing that. Um, there are people who are talented athletes out here, right? And people who are like, again, who are looking to go to college and, and those things make a difference, right? Um, so latching onto those, um, even just yesterday I had a patient in my, in my clinic who was saying, and this isn't an athlete, but it's just a student. So ADHD medication wasn't working as well as it was working before. And I said, well, what's changed? Well, I started to use puff bars, which is like a newer thing, uh, which is kind of like a jewel spin-off in a way. And you know, we bring it back to that whole thing that when we're smoking nicotine, you know, you, your medication was working well before. The puff bar is a new thing that's come in there. Your attention and focus is not as great. They are absolutely connected. And when you point that out, you know, he was able to have like a moment where he's able to be like, okay. That sparked that moment of like realization, that moment of like, this has an impact on what I'm doing, 
and what I'm trying to achieve is the end to kind of go to the next point to kind of say, let's use that as, an, as a way of changing what we're doing. Vaping has become like an entry to like other substance abuse like usage. Um, has there been an increase or a study like shown since vaping has started, like increase in teen usage of other substances significantly? And not to my knowledge again, because it's it's more so that um, if I look at if I remember like the SAMHSA data, which is the Substance Abuse Mental Health Association of America. Um, they actually show that tobacco use has gone down, marijuana use has gone up over the last two, three years, I want to say. Alcohol use has also, what did I say? Alcohol use has gone up. Opioid use has gone up as well. Um, and again, that's its own kind of subject. Um, but there's been an overall, I want to say, an increase in substance use. But again, it's. Is it a causation? Is it because of that? It's, it's hard to say. Thank you. I, what we know about nicotine is that it kind of quells the symptoms of anxiety and depression, right? So people who smoke or vape or use nicotine products tend to feel better in that way when they do it. So how do we, as practitioners or, or when whatever work we're doing with youth, reconcile that, the, the substance misuse? also with the mental health? Like, how can we best help people? So it's, it's understanding that, right, anything that we put into our body is going to have its effects. Um, it's true, right? Nicotine does have that anxiety releasing or anxiety kind of quelling kind of uh, component to it. It's stimulating. It can help to wake us up in the morning, right? So people will be like, I'll have a morning puff and I'm good to go for the day. And it's understanding, and again, it's kind of the education aspect of bringing around to say, sure, you're going to get that, but you're also getting everything else that comes along with it. You don't get to pick and choose what you get from it, right? So sure, can it help with that anxiety in the moment? Absolutely. Is it pushing, is it fixing or really helping as a whole on a baseline level that anxiety, or are we just kind of putting a band-aid on it? And then also, do we want everything that's associated, again, with the vaping? or with the smoking or whatever else that we're using, right? To kind of get to that point. Because again, it's a lot of it just comes back to education and saying, sure, you can get this, but you get this as well. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank everyone for attending and thank Dr. Mirza and King um, as well.